Hello, this is Mr. Salmingo. Um, if you remember last time, we were rudely interrupted. So where we left off was about energy transfer. So just to review where we left off was that we had talked about how energy flows only one way and chemicals cycle. So energy, where we left off, was talking about this caterpillar. So if a caterpillar eats, say, 200 joules of food, half of it just goes to, to pooping it out. Um, the other 100, part of it helps it grow, and 66% um, of it uh, is needed to for energy or to create energy. So let's just say when you eat food or when you transfer energy between organisms, it's very inefficient. In fact, it's only 10% efficient. So... This is a, an example of a pyramid of biomass. This is the bottom and this is the top. Let's just say sunlight, uh, a million joules, joules is a unit of energy, is being captured. The primary producers, like flowers, they only are able to capture 10,000 of it. The ones that eat the flowers, like this grasshopper, only get 1,000. The things that eat the grasshopper only get 100. Then tertiary consumers, like the one that eats this mouse, only gets 10 joules of energy. So there's two reasons why, um, or actually there's only one big reason why there's no like fifth consumers or fourth consumers is because the energy, if we keep going 10%, 10%, 10%, by the time you get all the way up here, there's really no energy to be taken once, uh, it, once something is eaten. So there's primary first, secondary second, and third tertiary, but there's really no fourth or fifth because there's no more energy left to be eaten. Um, so pyramids of energy or pyramids of biomass, um, they give us insight to what the food chains are. So for example, uh, like I was telling you, the loss of energy kind of limits how many top level carnivores there are. So for example, in a bluegrass field, there's like almost 6 million different types of plants or primary producers, but there's only three tertiary consumers just because again, only 10% is transferred. At the most, like you'll ever see, is four or five trophic levels. So this is like four trophic levels. You'll never see more than five. So matter, on the other hand, or chemicals, they cycle. So uh, there are different chemical cycles you need to know for the AP exam. As a matter of fact, I believe there are four, but I think this one, um, actually there might be four that we're gonna go over real quick. So there are four biogeochemical cycles and it just shows you how it cycles. Basically, they switch from organic to inorganic. And there's a typo here, it should be phosphorus, but the four you need to know for your exam, water, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Water, or sorry, water is the easiest, so we're gonna skip that, but water, you should know, like there's precipitation, it rains, it runs off, it goes into the ocean, it evaporates, becomes a cloud, and then precipitation all over again. The carbon cycle is very simple. Basically, we breathe out carbon dioxide, Plants breathe in carbon dioxide. We breathe out, they breathe in. Breathe out, breathe in. That's what the cycle is. Photosynthesis and respiration. But the problem is, is that because of fossil fuels, because we use so much oils and gases, it goes into the atmosphere. So really, even though this is supposed to be the only cycle, what also happens is that we burn fossil fuels, which adds more carbon dioxide in the air. You may be wondering, oops, sorry. You may be wondering, or maybe you're not wondering, um, where does that carbon dioxide come from for oils and fuels? Well, when we die, when animals die, they go into the earth and carbon is trapped and eventually it becomes oil or fuel. So if you really want to know where gas comes from, like the gas in your car, they're from basically millions and millions of organisms that died, maybe dinosaurs that died, that decomposed and eventually became oil or carbon. We we uh, mine that, we extract it, and then we burn it, and then we have way more carbon in the atmosphere than they're supposed to be. So it's removed by photosynthesis, and then we add because of fossil fuels. Nitrogen cycle, for some reason, is the hardest one because some people have a hard time visualizing it. So again, we'll talk about it in class. But long story short, you know the most, the, actually, some people may not even know this, the most abundant gas in the atmosphere is nitrogen. People think oxygen, or if not oxygen, carbon dioxide, but really it's nitrogen. What happens is that nitrogen in the atmosphere cannot be used. Like we can't use nitrogen. There's nothing that we could use it on. So bacteria um, that are like attached to plants or on plants, they fix it. So that's what it means by nitrogen fixation. We fix it so that the nitrogen can actually be used. Okay. So the plants, like this one right here, um, or here we go, nitrogen fixing bacteria in the root nodules of legumes, or another fancy word for bacteria in plants. They fix the nitrogen. 
now that it's fixed, they continue to break it down into thinking something that can be used. So from that nitrogen, it turns into ammonium, ammonium into nitrite, nitrite into nitrate. And that is what can be absorbed by plants, and that is kind of the nutrients that plants need to grow. Denitrification, so once the decomposers get a, uh, get a hand on it, um, they break it down, nitrifying bacteria, nitrifying bacteria, and then denitrifying bacteria, bring it back into the atmosphere. So that's how it even got into the atmosphere in the first place. Again, it's a small piece for the AP exam, just something that you need to know. There's a lot of see, there's a lot of different steps, but you know, as long as you know these big three, you'll be okay. Nitrogen is fixed, then it's nitrified, so plants can use it, and then it's denitrified and goes back in the atmosphere. Then um, we talked about the water cycle already, but what you need to know about the water cycle is like acid, particularly. Um, how we destroy the water, uh, the water cycle. So normally, uh, if you remember pH, 8 is, uh, uh, or sorry, sorry, 7 is normal, like, like water. But if pH has less than 5.6, they call it acid rain or acid precipitation. They call it acid precipitation because it could be rain, it could be snow, it could be fog. The reason why we have acid rain is just because we burn wood and fossil fuels. The sulfur and the nitrogen from the wood and the fossil fuels, they mix in with the, the clouds and now we rain acid. So they fall back as acid precipitation and they damage ecosystems greatly. So as you could probably like probably picture in your heads, these acids, they rain down, they kill plants, they kill trees. Um, but what most people don't know is that water ra um, runs off into lakes and rivers and streams. And what it does is it kills aquatic organisms um, and plants more so than like the trees on land. Um, another thing you need to know is called biomagnification. Again, we're all talking about things that we do to destroy uh, the ecology that we're studying. Um, some of you may have heard of biomagnification, which is short for biological magnification. So what happens is that toxins, they become more concentrated the more and more you go up a food chain or more up a food web. Um, as you go up and up and up, they can't be broken down and they magnify as you go up the food chain. So hence, biomagnification. As you go up the food chain, the poison, I guess you could say, magnifies. So I don't know if you heard this about mercury um, in fish, but essentially, like plankton can get a hold of, say, for example, a, a really bad factory uh, dumps their toxic waste into the ocean. So the plankton eat it. These fish eat a whole bunch of plankton. So now they have what's this is called one parts per million. The trout eat a whole bunch of these smelts. So now they have four parts per million. And then the birds, they eat these trout, and their eggs actually have 124 parts per million of this toxin. So even though it doesn't hurt the zooplankton or the phytoplankton, it's really bad for these eggs. And I don't know if you've ever heard this story before, but um, the mercury was so bad, I want to say in Japan, that these eggs, the, the shell was so soft that when the birds would you know, lay on the eggs to warm them, they would crack because of all that mercury that was in their system, that when they made the eggs, the egg cells were so soft. So it's really bad. Another way we destroy the, uh, another way we destroy the ecology, we talk about carbon being too much in the air. So because we burn so much fuel, um, I don't know if you've heard of Inconvenient Truth or have you seen it, but basically this black line represents how much carbon dioxide has been in the air. And this red line is the average temperature of the world. So long story short, as the carbon dioxide has gone up in our air, so has the global temperature. That's why they call it global warming. Um, so long story short, global warming, because there's so much carbon dioxide, um, the increase, the temperature has been increasing on average. It doesn't look like a lot, two degrees, but for the whole earth, that's a lot. What's so bad about global warming? Well, the one that most people realize is that the ice caps will melt, which means things would, um, areas would flood, and also polar bears or penguins that live at the poles would have no habitat. So it's very important, as you may have heard, to not drive so much, not to use as much electricity, because that always adds carbon dioxide to the air. And then you may have heard of the ozone hole, but uh, basically some people can mix up global warming and ozone. Ozone is bad, like you can't, if you have ozone in the air, if we breathe it, it's like very deadly. But in the atmosphere, it's very good because it blocks out UV rays. But the problem is that we, there's something called CFCs or chlorine-containing compounds, and they erode the ozone layer. 
So here's an example of an ozone layer, uh, blue meaning there's a hole. So as the, as the years have gone by, the hole of the ozone has gotten bigger, which means more UV rays enter the earth, which means more cases of skin cancer or harming other animals. And the last slide, uh, basically here are diversity is what we crave. We want diversity. Here's the four ways humans destroy diversity. One, we destroy their habitat. So, you know, chopping down forest, habitat destruction, that's bad. Introduce species. We talked about this very briefly, but um, you introduce species that don't belong in that area. Uh, I don't know if I ever told you the story, but in Australia, they introduced these toads. And the only problem is that there was no predator for these toads in Australia. So they took over almost all of Australia because there's nothing to, there's no predators to kill the, the toads. Over exploitation, which means over harvesting plants or animals to the point there's no more. Uh, in the mid United States, we did that, oh gosh, the 1800s, there was tons of buffalo in the North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, that area. And because they loved the buffalo so much, they killed it to the point where they couldn't reproduce anymore. And now there's barely any buffalo in that part of the United States. And then lastly, we destroy the food chain. Uh, remember I talked to you in the last video about keystone species. So if you kill like the middle, if you kill the middle animal, um, it destroys the whole food chain. So the example I gave you last time was a sea otter. You kill the sea otter, um, there's gonna be so many sea urchins. And if there's so many sea urchins, uh, all the seaweed, all the kelp is gone and nobody else can live. So those are the four ways we destroy diversity. Do you have to memorize all four? Probably not. Is there gonna be a question that says, what are the four? Probably not. But you should know in your back pocket, like if there's a question to ask, what are the human threats to biodiversity? You know a few examples. So thanks for watching. This is again, a, a big review on ecology. Um, I think it's the easiest topic. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask myself or Mr. Xu. So thanks for watching and I'll see y'all later.